My name is Johan Norberg, a writer and an analyst, and I was born and raised here in Sweden. I was three years old when the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Milton Friedman here in Stockholm. This is Stockholm City Hall, the traditional place for the Nobel banquet. This is where Milton Friedman celebrated his prize. Milton Friedman did a lot more than win the Nobel Prize here in Stockholm. He had a thought-provoking message that won him thousands of advocates and opponents all over the world. In 2002, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Friedman, and the thing that struck me was his intellectual curiosity. By Thomas Jefferson his research led him to believe in the power of free markets and economic freedom, while many people today place a greater emphasis on government safety nets and greater financial equality. On this 30th anniversary of Milton Friedman's PBS television series, I'll revisit his ideas on the struggle between freedom and equality. Major funding for this program was provided by Thomas W. and Diane Smith. Additional funding was provided by Chris and Melody Rufer, Olaf Niels Sunda, Robert and Marion Oster, and the Hickory Foundation. No matter where you come from, whenever there's a problem, it's tempting to look to the government for solutions. Since the recession of 2008, we've seen unprecedented government intervention in the financial sector and in the automotive industry. We've seen new spending programs, more tariffs and new regulations. And we've seen the largest buildup of government debt in American history. A debt that might haunt us for generations. Some people blame the financial crisis on Milton Friedman and his theories of free markets. But Friedman would say that economic freedom is not just to reap the rewards when times are good. It's also to bear the consequences of your actions when times are bad. We don't have free markets as long as speculators can keep the profits when they win, but send the losses to the taxpayers when they lose. I was born and raised in Sweden, and my country has made an effort to make people's lives more equal. To reduce differences of outcome, we tax heavily and redistribute wealth among our citizens. And many people in the United States advocate a system like ours. If, on the other hand, the government gives everybody the same freedom to work and reap the rewards, some will do better than others. The result will be equality of opportunity, but not equality of outcome. Here in the United States, you've accepted more inequality of outcome. And over the past 30 years, a debate has been raging between these two competing alternatives. Can we live with economic freedom, even though it doesn't guarantee a specific result? even though it's built on the ongoing destruction of old ideas and businesses that are no longer competitive? Can we accept freedom, even though freedom to choose also means that we will not all be equally successful? To answer these questions, Milton Friedman traveled the world to examine various economic systems. He concluded that for most people, an emphasis on economic freedom would lead to both individual and political freedom. Many commentators say that Milton Friedman did more for freedom than anybody else in recent decades. He convinced many nations to embrace economic freedom. In the US, he led the effort to abolish the military draft, which he considered nothing less than slavery. It is long past time that we return to our basic heritage, got rid of the compulsion in our military service, and returned to a voluntary system. When Milton Friedman died in 2006, the Economist magazine's obituary had the headline, How Milton Freed Man. On the other hand, writers like the Canadian anti-capitalist Naomi Klein claim that he helped authoritarians by advising them to adopt free market economic policies. Most controversially, in 1975, Friedman traveled to Chile to lecture about economic liberalization. And he also met with the dictator, Augusto Pinochet. And in 1988, he went to China to talk to the communist leaders about economic reform. So who's right? Friedman would advise us to test his ideas by examining the evidence of recent history. Have his ideas changed our world? 
for better or for worse, whose assessment of his legacy is right? Milton Friedman is one of the most famous and influential economists of our time. He was born on July 31st, 1912, and received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. As a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, he had great influence on the entire field of economics. He was an author and an advisor to several presidents. He spent most of his life promoting the benefits of a free market economic system. Friedman thought that most people are well equipped to take care of themselves, no matter where they come from, no matter what gender they are, no matter which race or creed they belong to. He thought that freedom from government barriers gave everybody the freedom to try, to start a business, to learn a trade, to get a good job, to become rich if they're successful. And it denied the powerful and the vested interest the right to distort the outcome. In 1980, Friedman presented his ideas to America through a 10-hour PBS series that was called Free to Choose. He traveled to places he felt could best communicate his ideas. Milton Friedman began his PBS series Free to Choose in New York City with a bit of personal history because he felt that it was important to remember how America's success story began. This statue is iconic. It represents freedom. And for the immigrants who were welcomed by the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, America was truly a land of opportunity. They poured ashore in their best clothes, eager and expectant, carrying what little they owned. They were poor, but they all had a great deal of hope. Once they arrived, they found, as my parents did, not an easy life, but a very hard life. Friedman's parents passed through these doors here on Ellis Island, and they shared this background with millions of immigrants from all over the world. About a fifth of all Swedes migrated from my homeland to America to find a place where their own talents and hard work made a difference. Here on Ellis Island, they met the new world for the first time, and then they moved to the cities and to the frontier in search of the promise of the American dream. Not all of them found it, but many did. There were many rewards for hard work, enterprise, and ability. Life was hard, but opportunity was real. There were few government programs to turn to and nobody expected them. But also, there were few rules and regulations. There were no licenses, no permits, no red tape to restrict them. They found, in fact, a free market, and most of them thrived on it. This is exactly the same kind of a factory that my mother worked in when she came to this country for the first time at the age of 14, almost 90 years ago. And if there had not been factories like this here then at which she could have started to work and earned a little money, she wouldn't have been able to come. And if I existed at all, I'd be a Russian or a Hungarian today instead of American. But over the next 75 years, the United States began to restrict the workings of the free market. Every line of business was regulated, and soon the highest tax rate surpassed 70%. In 1980, when Friedman wanted to show a truly free economy, he took the viewer to the other side of the world. If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. Hong Kong, a place with hardly any natural resources. About the only one you can name is a great harbor. Yet the absence of natural resources hasn't prevented rapid economic development. When Milton Friedman rode on this ferry in 1980, Hong Kong was not a part of China, but was leased to Britain as a colony. And it had just made an incredible journey, one that demonstrated to the world that even the poorest countries can develop. After the Second World War and the Communist Revolution in China, this rock in the middle of nowhere became a refugee camp with millions of extremely poor people. To Milton Friedman, the scientist, this was a perfect natural experiment to test his theory about free markets. Hong Kong had no prospects, no natural resources and little land that could be cultivated. 
but almost by accident it was given economic freedom. The British government couldn't be bothered with local Hong Kong affairs, and the governor here happened to favor free markets. So Hong Kong never introduced all those policies that other governments did. No tariffs, no regulations, or government intervention in the economy. So the economy could evolve in a natural way. As a result, Hong Kong became an economic powerhouse. When Friedman came to Hong Kong in 1980, it could boast statistics on life expectancy and infant mortality that equaled Western countries. Incredibly, it was on its way to become richer than its colonial ruler, Britain. This thriving, bustling, dynamic city has been made possible by the free market, indeed the freest market in the world. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. And it's that atmosphere of incentive that has induced them to work, to adjust, to save, to produce a miracle. And what a miracle it's been. Friedman was standing next to the tallest building on the skyline. And just look at that skyline now. There are more skyscrapers here than in all of New York City. Between 1950 and 2000, Hong Kong's GDP per capita increased more than 10 times. Friedman concluded that this success was due to the free market. This hasn't been achieved by government action, by someone sitting in one of those tall buildings telling people what to do. It's been achieved by allowing the market to work. The complete absence of tariffs or any other restrictions on trade is one of the main reasons why Hong Kong has been able to provide such a rapidly rising standard of life for its people. In 1980, when Milton Friedman wanted to see a truly free market, he had to come here, to Hong Kong. Since then, much of the world has followed in Hong Kong's path. In an effort to get out of its stagnation of the 1970s, the US and Western Europe began to return to the ideals of free competition. Taxes were lowered, tariffs were reduced, and regulations slashed. Hong Kong is now part of China, but at times it seems more like Hong Kong took over China rather than the other way around. The communist leaders on the mainland, they looked around at their more successful neighbors and then decided to set their own markets free. And Asia's other giant, India, they also opened their economy to the rest of the world. In Eastern Europe, communism collapsed because the economy never could satisfy the needs of the people and they were longing for freedom. In 1991, in the small Baltic country of Estonia, Prime Minister Mart Lahr took his inspiration from Milton Friedman's book, Free to Choose, which was based on the TV series. He decided to imitate the Hong Kong model, with zero tariffs, a flat tax, and a minimum of regulation. Despite its problems with the 2008 financial crisis, Estonia is widely seen as the most successful of the former communist economies. Free markets have spread around the world. At the same time, we've seen the fastest human progress ever. And it has been led by the countries that opened up their economies. In fact, average incomes around the world have almost doubled. Think about these statistics. Globally, extreme poverty has been more than half since Milton Friedman did his series in 1980. Amazingly, 730 million people have been liberated from poverty. Every year, life expectancy around the world has increased by three months, despite AIDS and despite malaria. And to me, one of the most heartening facts is that the risk of parents losing their child in infancy has almost been cut in half. These were the results that Friedman predicted free markets could bring about. As people got more wealthy, they could begin to deal with the most important challenges in their lives. But Friedman had another reason why he wanted authoritarian dictatorships to liberalize their economies. Political freedom. Human and political freedom 
has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Those of us who have been so fortunate as to have been born in a free society tend to take freedom for granted, to regard it as a natural state of mankind. It is not. It is a rare and precious thing. He thought that economic freedom would directly lead to political freedom. When people begin to make their own decisions and gain confidence in their ability to take care of themselves, Friedman believed they would begin to demand personal and political freedoms as well. When we say that a market is free, it sounds a bit like a dog-eat-dog -dog economy. But that is not what Friedman had in mind. He thought that the best explanation of why the free market works was developed more than 200 years ago in Scotland, where Adam Smith taught at the University of Glasgow. Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, explains why free choice and voluntary association is often more well-functioning and orderly than commands from the top. Voluntary association is what we do together of our own free will. When these people buy and sell to each other and none is subject to force or fraud, that is voluntary association. It is anything that is going on between consenting adults. When you visit marketplaces around the world, they can sure look like chaos, but underneath the surface, it is highly organized, not from above, but by people's own interests and actions. Friedman thought that Adam Smith had the answer. Adam Smith's flash of genius was to see how prices that emerged in the market, the prices of goods, the wages of labor, and the cost of transport, could coordinate the activities of millions of independent people, strangers to one another, without anybody telling them what to do. His key idea was that self-interest could produce an orderly society benefiting everybody. It was as though there were an invisible hand at work. What did Adam Smith mean by self-interest and an invisible hand? By self-interest, he wasn't thinking of greed, just taking what you can get. He was thinking of the day-to-day -day decisions that we all make to better our lives. The clothes we wear, what car we drive, even whether we like our fish really fresh. The market tells producers not only what to produce, but how best to produce it through another set of prices. The cost of materials, the wages of labor, and so on. Walk down any street in Hong Kong and you'll see the impersonal forces of the market in operation. If I want to buy a tomato, I could buy one right here at the market from Hung Choi. But if everybody suddenly wanted to buy tomatoes, perhaps because we get new information about how good they are for our health, well, then there would be too few tomatoes. So Hung Choi's suppliers would have to charge him more. In that case, I have to pay more to lay my hands on one. If prices increase, farmers will notice. Without knowing us or without even having heard about the new health information. They can see with their own eyes that they would make more money if they produced tomatoes rather than, say, broccoli. And in that case, more farmers will move into tomato production and the supply will be increased. Hung Choi's costs are reduced, and in order to sell more tomatoes than his competitors, he once again starts charging less for tomatoes. At that point, no more farmers are tempted to move into that line of work. When I buy a tomato, and when someone else is buying some fish, we control the supply on the market. We vote with our pocketbooks, and all around the world, people spring into action to satisfy our demands. Every purchase sends a message. This is how the market economy works in every sector, from tomatoes to apples to Apple computers. And this is Adam Smith's invisible hand. To make your life better, you have to better the lives of others. Invisible hands are all around us. Friedman borrowed an example from economist Leonard Reed to show that something that we take for granted and use every day is the result of a complex interaction between thousands of people. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood 
from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. But obviously, the pencil is no longer one of our most important tools of communication. This is, and the production of a smartphone is not less complex, to say the least. This display is made in Japan, and the camera in Vietnam. The microphones come from Austria and the chipset from France. The memory is produced in Korea and the battery in China. And the software and design centers are all over the world in countries like India, Finland, Britain and the US. Thousands of people on several continents cooperated to make these phones so that we could have them. People from different countries, different cultures, people who had never even met. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. We have a choice of smartphones, tomatoes, even trucks, because of competition. Sometimes the price is too high, sometimes the product doesn't work, and sometimes the service is lousy. But in that case, someone else can enter the market and take all the customers. So every company has to offer us something better to stay in business. Some succeed, but some fail. And it's that risk of failure that really scares us. When a businessman faces trouble, a market threatens to disappear, or a new competitor arises, there are two things he can do. He can turn to the government for a tariff or a quota or some other restriction on competition, or he can adjust and adapt. In Hong Kong, the first option is closed. Hong Kong is too dependent on foreign trade so that the government has simply had to adopt a policy of complete non-interference. That's tough on some individuals, but it's extremely healthy for the society as a whole. Only the businessmen who can adapt who are flexible and adjustable, survive, and they create good employment opportunities for the rest. So this is the kind of boxes that you were producing here when Milton Friedman came by to visit? Mr. Chung makes metal containers. Nobody's ordered him to. He does it because he's found that he can do better for himself that way than by making anything else. But if demand for metal containers went down, Mr. Chung would soon get that message. And Mr. Jung is still here, and nowadays he produces more things for the tourist trade. But when only the flexible and adaptable survive, thank you Mr. Jung, it means that other businesses fail. Economists call this constant renewal of the economy creative destruction. If we want to increase our wealth and opportunities, we have to stop doing old things in old ways and start doing innovative things in better ways. In other words, we have to be creative. But when consumers move on to new goods, it can be difficult and painful because old factories and old shops close and people lose their jobs. That is the destructive part. And yet, most economists think that creative destruction is necessary for economic development. Mrs. Lee starts out every day with her lunch, her teapot and her cell phone. Cell phones are important for boat drivers around here because they used to pass messages by shouting to one another. Not terribly efficient and very bad for your voice. Hong Kong has the most cell phones in the world. 1.7 cell phones per person. But all around the globe we've seen a cell phone revolution. In 1980 there were 11 million cell phones on the planet. Today almost 4 billion people have access to cell phones. This is an example of creative destruction. It used to be all landlines made of copper, but now they become less and less important, especially in the developing world. This farmer in Bangladesh was always dependent on one buyer of her eggs and had to accept his prices. But now she can check the price of eggs in other village markets with her cell phone before she sells, and so she can negotiate a better price. In Tanzania, it used to be that the customer often had to sit and wait for hours at the butchers for the meat to arrive. 
and sometimes in Peru, the meat had to wait because the customers didn't know that it was already there. Today, you coordinate the business with a cell phone and the food ends up in people's stomachs and not in the garbage. We have rarely seen a technology that has meant so much for human development, but that was not the intention. The telecom companies wanted more market share. Those who adapted and distributed the technology locally wanted to make money. And butchers and egg farmers just wanted to improve their own lives. Adam Smith would say that it was as if they were led by an invisible hand when they rolled out this technology faster than any technology in world history. And many would say that this revolution did more to give the average person power and to reduce poverty more than any government program. But all progress comes at a cost. Market forces are both creative and destructive. As people buy cell phones, they ditch their home phones. And then there is no need for all those workers who used to connect homes to wires and repair telephone lines. And that is tens of thousands of people who worked hard and supported their families and through no fault of their own lost their jobs and whose skills might not be in demand as the technology takes a new leap. Some succeed in inventing the next smartphone and become incredibly rich. Others are stuck with an obsolete technology. Some win, some lose, and the result is something that most people have a problem with, inequality. Equality is a powerful concept, one that we can all cherish to some degree. In fact, it's fair to say that in one sense, America was built on the idea of equality. Equality is so important that here in Washington, D.C., there is a monument dedicated to Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was one of the founding fathers, and he wrote the American Declaration of Independence with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What did Thomas Jefferson mean by the words, all men are created equal? What he meant by the words equal can be seen in the phrase endowed by their creator. To Thomas Jefferson, all men are equal in the eyes of God. They all must be treated as individuals who have each separately, a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Of course, practice did not conform to the ideals. In Jefferson's life, or in ours as a nation, he agonized repeatedly during his lifetime about the conflict between the institution of slavery and the fine words of the Declaration. Yet, during his whole life, he was a slave owner. But during the 19th century, the powerful words and ideals of the Declaration of Independence helped more people to see the horrors of slavery, and it helped to end forced labor. Practice began to catch up with the ideals. The idea of equality came more and more to mean that everyone should have the same opportunity to make what he could of his capacities. That all careers should be open to people on the basis of their talents, independently of the race or religion or belief or social class that characterized them. This concept of equality of opportunity offers no conflict at all with the concept of freedom. On the contrary, they reinforce one another and it is no doubt the concept that even today is most widely held. But during the 20th century, as people were confronted with some of the differences of outcome that were the result of free markets, a very different ideal began to emerge. And Friedman thought that this ideal was in conflict with freedom. That is the ideal that everyone should be equal in income, in level of living, in what he has. The idea that the economic race should be so arranged that everybody ends at the finish line at the same time rather than that everyone starts at the beginning line at the same time. This concept raises a very serious problem for freedom. It is clearly in conflict with it, since it requires that the freedom of some be restricted in order to provide greater benefits to others. 
How did the idea that governments should change economic outcomes become popular in the West? In a way, it started here in 1929 when the stock market crashed. The Wall Street crash was followed by the worst depression in American history. That depression has been blamed on the failure of capitalism. It was no such thing, but the myth lives on. Friedman thought that the Great Depression was the result of massive government failure, of stupid monetary policies and tariffs that created a trade war. But the common interpretation at the time was that capitalism had failed and that you couldn't just leave things for themselves in the face of massive unemployment and widespread poverty. So politicians worldwide were looking for a new approach. Roosevelt's first priority after his election was to deal with massive unemployment. A public works program was started. The government financed projects to build highways, bridges, and dams. Roosevelt wanted to see America move into a new era. The Social Security Act was passed and other measures followed. Unemployment benefits, welfare payments, distribution of surplus food. With these measures, of course, came rules, regulations, and red tape, as familiar today as they were novel then. The government bureaucracy began to grow, and it's been growing ever since. The United States became a bit more like European countries, like my home country, Sweden, by introducing some wealth redistribution and more government control over the economy. My country has made an effort to make people's lives more equal. We have relatively free markets in business. It's fairly easy to start a company and compete without being stopped by licenses, regulations and tariffs. But when people are allowed to compete freely, some win and make a lot of money. Some lose and they lag behind. That's when the Swedish government steps in. To reduce differences of outcome, we tax heavily and redistribute wealth among our citizens. To many, this is the best of both worlds, since we don't really have equal chances in life. Some people have parents who give them an interest in learning, ambition and opportunities. Some don't. Some are lucky in the genetic lottery and some aren't. Some have good health and some don't. To reduce the gaps that such differences might lead to, our government steps in. Sweden chose to make equality a priority in the 1970s, when we were already one of the richest countries in the world. Taxes were raised and benefit systems were made more generous. Public spending almost doubled between 1960 and 1980, from 31% to 60% of GDP. Some would say that this has made our country better, but it has also reduced the rewards for working hard and taking risks. This is a museum recreation of the original workshop of Lars Magnus Eriksson. He was a very important person in Swedish history because more than 130 years ago he produced cheap and reliable versions of the telephones that he had seen in the United States. And because of this Stockholm became a global center for telecommunication in the late 19th century and it laid the groundwork for one of Sweden's most successful companies, Ericsson. And today, it still employs more than 80,000 people in 150 countries. This should make me proud as a Swede, but in fact it makes me a bit worried, because almost all big Swedish businesses share Ericsson's heritage, and they probably all had boardrooms that looked a bit like this. The average big Swedish company is 94 years old. We have apparently not had the policies that encourage people to start the new businesses that might become tomorrow's Ericsson. Today, Swedish entrepreneurs are the oldest in the world. This is the other side of the coin. The young people and the immigrants who should be our future are not starting the new Ericsson's. In fact, we have many examples of young Swedes and entrepreneurial immigrants who move from Sweden to Britain or the United States because the rewards are much greater there where taxes are lower. In 
In many suburbs like this outside of Stockholm, the unemployment rate is higher than 50%. Even in the midst of the economic boom, almost a quarter of the working age population in Sweden did not go to work in the morning, but got their checks from the government. It does seem to support the view that economic incentives matter. With the sickness benefit of up to 80% of your income, perhaps it wasn't surprising that Swedes were off sick more than any other people, even though we objectively were healthier than almost any other population. In 2004, sickness benefits absorbed 16% of the government's budget. These statistics have improved since, but interestingly, only after a determined effort by the government to reduce the equality of income by lowering taxes and making benefit systems less generous. So it seems that these changes increased the incentives to work. Friedman emphasized something counterintuitive. There is a positive benefit to inequality of outcome for everybody. Some people become millionaires and some become billionaires, but that is because they were the ones who made their customers happy. That's the economic system that has transformed our society in the past century and more. That's what gave the Henry Fords, the Thomas Alva Edisons, the incentives to produce the miracles that have benefited us all. They went in with their eyes open. They knew what they were doing. And win or lose, we society benefited from their willingness to take a chance. If we did not allow a Lars Magnus Ericsson, a Thomas Edison or a Bill Gates to become incredibly rich, we would be more equal. But Friedman would ask, would we be better off? If entrepreneurs did not think that a possible reward for all the sacrifices they make, all their hard work, all the risks they take, is a lot of wealth, then they might do something else instead. And in that case, we would not have the goods and the services and technologies that make our lives better. We like the products of the free market, the wealth, the choices, the goods and the services that previous generations could not have dreamt of. But we're not as willing to accept the workings of the free market. The seemingly chaotic ups and downs, the fact that it produces both winners and losers. So we give the government power to deal with these problems. Listen to these words from 1980. Don't they still ring true today? Every time I come to Washington, I'm impressed all over again with how much power is concentrated in this city. But we must understand the character of that power. It is not monolithic power in a few hands, the way it is in countries like the Soviet Union or Red China. It is fragmented into lots of little bits and pieces, with every special group around the country trying to get its hand on whatever bits and pieces it can. The result is that there's hardly an issue in which you won't find government on both sides. For example, in one of these massive buildings scattered all through this town, filled to the bursting with government employees, some of them are sitting around trying to figure out how to spend our money to discourage us from smoking cigarettes. In another of the massive buildings, maybe far away from the first, some other employees, equally dedicated, equally hardworking, are sitting around figuring out how to spend our money to subsidize farmers to grow more tobacco. Well, it's obvious that things haven't changed much. US politicians still spend tax dollars on anti-smoking campaigns, and tobacco farming is still subsidized by the government. Each of these programs spends money taken from our pockets that we could be using to buy goods and services to meet our separate needs. All of these programs use very able, very skilled people who could be doing productive things. Once you've created a special interest group, it's difficult to uncreate it. Every so often, a bill is introduced to Congress to eliminate tobacco subsidies, and routinely they're voted down. Who knows, maybe one day one will pass. In the economic market, people who intend to serve only their own private interests are led by an invisible hand to serve public interests that it was no part of their intention to promote. In the political market, there's an invisible hand operating as well. But unfortunately, it operates in the opposite direction. People who intend only to serve the public interest are led by an invisible hand to serve private interests that it was no part of their intention to promote. 
It's not that people in government aren't well-intentioned. These are not evil people purposely trying to wrest away our freedoms. It's just the nature of the job. The deals made here affect all of us, and sometimes in ways we don't like. But don't blame the people making the deals. They're just pursuing their own self-interest, which may be as narrow as making a buck or as broad as trying to reform the world. Friedman worried that people would stop doing what they and others they deal with thought was best, and instead they would be doing what the government encouraged or required through regulation, taxes and tax loopholes, and that creates new problems. Taxation to help the poor might result in less growth and so less poverty reduction. And bans on abortion may mean that abortion takes place anyway, but becomes less safe. Tighter border controls might force immigrants to stay in the US once they manage to get in, rather than risk going back when the economy retracts and there are fewer employment opportunities. Every government intervention results in unintended consequences. These consequences have to be dealt with as well, and that leads to new unintended consequences. The result is a constant growth of government. In 1980, Friedman designed a very graphic way to highlight this problem. The federal regulations that govern our lives are available in many places. One set is here, in the Library of Congress, in Washington, D.C. In 1936, the federal government established the Federal Register to record all of the regulations, hearings, and other matters connected with the agencies in Washington. This is volume one, number one. In 1936, it took three volumes like this to record all these matters. In 1937, it took four. And then it grew and grew and grew. At first, rather slowly and gradually, but even so, year by year, it took a bigger and bigger pile to hold all the regulations and hearings for that year. Then around 1970 came a veritable explosion so that one pile is no longer enough to hold the regulations for that year. It takes two and then three piles until on one day in 1977, September 28th, the Federal Register had no fewer than 1,754 pages. And these aren't exactly what you would call small pages either. It wasn't always like this. America was founded with something different in mind. Milton Friedman came here to Philadelphia, an independence hall, to reflect on the founding fathers. Almost 200 years ago, a remarkable group of men gathered in this room to write a constitution for the new nation that they had helped to create a few years earlier. They were a wise and learned group of people. They had learned the lesson of history. The great danger to freedom is the concentration of power, especially in the hands of a government. They were determined to protect the citizens of the new United States of America from that danger. And they crafted their constitution with that in mind. That constitution has served us well. It has enabled us to preserve our freedom for close on to 200 years. But in the past 50 years, we have been forgetting the lesson that the wise men knew so well. From regarding government as a threat to our freedom, we have come more and more to regard government as a benefactor from which all good things flow. Friedman was afraid that a bigger government would threaten the incredible results of economic freedom. Because the economy is not a zero-sum game. In other words, we're not fighting over ever smaller pieces of the pie. The pie is constantly growing larger as people and businesses become more productive. And the world is getting wealthier all the time. In the last 100 years, with relatively free markets, we have created more wealth than in the 100,000 years before. And as a result, we have reduced extreme poverty around the world, more than people ever dreamed was possible. Americans and Swedes alike, we're all obsessed with our monthly paycheck. But how much that paycheck is really worth, to find out that is not as simple as it seems. What's the inflation rate? Do goods and services cost more or less today than they did last year? 
we have to look at what we can buy, how far that paycheck takes us. And that has increased dramatically because entrepreneurs become rich by constantly reducing the price of everything we want. Let's look at a couple of everyday items. 25 years ago, you had to work for 456 hours to be able to buy a cell phone. Today, after all the productivity increases that businesses and innovators have introduced, you only have to work for four hours. And of course, it's a better deal today. This is not just a phone. It also doubles as a texting device, a calendar, a camera, almost everything. In these same 25 years, the cost of a personal computer has been reduced from 435 hours to 25 hours. And you really couldn't compare it to those original PCs that wouldn't be able to run any of the software or the operating systems that we use today. What about a basic necessity like food? Well, we don't see the recent dramatic productivity increases that we see when we look at electronics. The great leap forward in agricultural technology happened 100 years ago. But with a long-term perspective, you certainly see a lot of change. In 1920, you had to work for 37 minutes to afford half a gallon of milk. Today, you wouldn't have to work more than seven minutes. And in 1920, it cost you two and a half hours to buy three pounds of chicken. Today, you'd get away with less than 14 minutes. Professor Friedman noticed something similar 30 years ago. Over a quarter of a century ago, I bought secondhand a desk calculator for which I paid $300. One of these little calculators today, which I can buy for $10 or so, will do everything that did and more beside. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? Friedman's conclusion was that accepting differences of outcome does not just make the winners better off, but the losers as well. People with a lot of money can afford to be early adopters. They can pay ridiculous amounts for the first versions of cell phones and personal computers. And that's a good thing for us, because they create bigger markets so the companies get revenue, so that they can streamline production and create lower cost versions so that all of us can buy one. And historically, this seems to be the case. Free markets regularly turn luxuries into consumer goods. This may seem hard to believe, but the average rate of ownership for refrigerators, air conditioners, and dishwashers is higher among poor American households today than they were for all American households in the early 1970s. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively, and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity, the major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of a society you have. It's the society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most. One thing is certain. Rarely in the history of mankind has freedom made such rapid progress as it has since Friedman produced Free to Choose in 1980. Whole populations yearning for freedom tore down the walls. Communism collapsed, the Soviet Union was abolished, and its satellite states were set free. Military dictatorships and the apartheid system were swept away. Most of the world embraced free market capitalism. Democracy spread and living standards surged. So, what really happened in Chile and China after Milton Friedman's controversial visits in the 1970s and 80s? Well, Chile liberalized the economy radically, put an end to inflation and adopted free trade. And after a difficult period of adjustment, the country experienced rapid growth and improved living standards. The pressure for a democratic transition grew. In 1987, political parties were legalized, and in 1988, there was a referendum on whether the dictator Pinochet would remain in power for eight years. Pinochet lost and had to resign, and the country continued making economic progress under a center-left leadership. 
Chile is now a stable democracy. Here it seems that Friedman was proven right. Economic freedom created wealth, and wealth undermined the dictatorship. In China, that is not the case, at least not yet. The Communist Party still runs the show, and opposition is vigorously suppressed. Still, economic reform has made an enormous difference in China. It has turned the country into the world's biggest exporter, with the world's fastest growth rates. It has led to the greatest poverty reduction in any country anywhere, ever. And hundreds of millions of Chinese are experiencing personal freedoms that were unheard of 30 years ago. We'll have to see what happens next. As economies have liberalized, the results are stunning. Extreme poverty around the world has been halved since Milton Friedman did his show. In fact, more than 70,000 people have left poverty every day since the early 1980s. That's almost 3,000 every hour, 124 people every minute around the clock. But at the same time, we see a widespread hostility against the free market system that made this possible. Freedom is not the natural state of mankind. It is a rare and wonderful achievement. It will take an understanding of what freedom is, of where the dangers to freedom come from. It will take the courage to act on that understanding if we are not only to preserve the freedoms that we have, but to realize the full potential of a truly free society. Equality sounds good, and some value equality of outcome more than anything else. The risk is that the outcome is that we're all equally poor. Market-based systems have made all of us richer, but some much richer than others. In the end, we have to decide whether this wealth is the problem or whether poverty is the problem. As Milton Friedman put it in 1980, the society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. <laughs>